like Dr. Shaver said, I want to speak on something that I'm really interested in, which is sickle cell disease and how to manage it in the ED, and talk about a couple of the pitfalls. Now, this is completely different from everything you've just done for the last, what, hour and a half. So um, I've tried to make it very simple. Um, if it's in red, it's a question for you to think about. If it's blue, it's the answer. So it makes it very easy. So these are um, just, as we get started, I'm going to, this question will come up in just a few minutes. Um, but what's the most common complication of sickle cell disease? So think about that in your head. And then um, the key points out of this whole lecture, so if you, if you tune out, come back on the blue parts, are right there. That's the things I'm going to cover. So as you know, sickle cell disease is a lifelong disease. It's an autosomal recessive um, disease, which means that your parents have to have the trait, and then you have to be unlucky enough to be in the 25% to get um, both of those genes so that it expresses um, phenotypically with you. Um, so uh, it's not something you want um, because uh, your red cells end up sticking together when they become deoxygenated, and that's what causes all the symptoms of things we see in the emergency department. So they become polymerized and they are um, block blood vessels and they cause all kinds of problems. And we don't get to that in just a second. The thing, the reason why we're talking about this is because a lot of us treat kids in the emergency department, but some of us only treat adults. And then 20 years ago, uh, you know, sickle cell disease in the adult population was not that prevalent because most of them died young. And so now we're starting to see more and more people that are in our adult ERs that have sickle cell disease. And they generally have a very severe form of the disease the older they get. Now, some of them do um, are lucky and they make it pretty far in life. So they're 60 and 70 year old patients with sickle cell disease, but most of them die at a very young age, um, even, even now. And usually it's because of one of these three clinical manifestations. So it's either from hemolysis, basal occlusion, or it's a vasculopathy. So pretty much everything that you can think of of a complication will fit into one of those um, categories. Hemolysis is the one that we always think about. You know, they have uh, low hemoglobin. Vasoclusion is the one we see in the ED, so they come in for pain. And vasculopathy are stuff like pulmonary hypertension, stroke. We don't, leg ulcers, we don't see that necessarily as often. Um, but what I find very interesting about sickle cell disease is even though the genotype might be the same, so hemoglobin SS, you know, that's what we call them. That's what their disease is. They have two abnormal hemoglobin genes um, and they manifest a disease, their phenotypes are very different. So there's a huge broad range of spectrum of patients that you can see with a lot of different complications. So some of them may only have the vasculopathy kind of complication. So they may only have leg ulcers. Some of them have severe vasoocclusion, so you're seeing them all the time in the emergency department. So they're very interesting in that they don't all present the same even though they have the same disease. So here's our first take home point. So history and vital signs are the best tools to evaluate a patient with sickle cell disease. Okay, history and vital signs. So here's the question. This is what I asked you a few minutes ago. What's the most common complication of sickle cell disease? All right, everybody's got that, right? It's the thing we see all the time, pain, right? So they come to the emergency department, they're complaining of pain. That's a vasoocclusive crisis. The new, more um, common term is a painful episode, an acute painful episode. And so this is usually caused by an acute ischemic injury. Um, you can think of it as an infarction of the soft tissues, bone, you know, vital organs um, that occurs because of vasoocclusion of those sticky red cells and that um, polymerization we talked about. They stick in those blood vessels, they stop blood flow, and then you get the complications of ischemia. Now, the interesting thing about the history for a patient with sickle cell disease is that they are very common it's very common for them to have the pain in the same location over and over and over again. And so when you're evaluating somebody with sickle cell disease, you really should ask them, you know, have you had pain there before? Because if they had pain there before, your, um, your, your awareness, your suspicion of something more going on should go down a little bit. But if it's in a new location, like they've never had a headache before, now they've got a headache. They don't usually have abdominal pain, but now they've got abdominal pain. They never had chest pain with their crisis before, but now they do. You really have to have a very high index of suspicion that there's something bad going on. And we'll talk about more of that in just a second. And then the other thing is, is that um, if, they, if they have pain, they often have it in multiple sites. So we do pain logs and we look at, look at their, where they're reporting they have pain. 
and it's very common for them to have you know check boxes on every box so it goes all the way up both legs across the pelvis up into the abdomen into the chest it's very common to have widespread pain but that doesn't necessarily tell you exactly what's going on you just have to know that it's an ischemic episode you're going to believe what they say and you'll go on there so when people talk about sickle cell pain I mean all of us have seen patients that come into the emergency department you know every other day every week every month you know and you know them by name but it's really not that common for a sickle cell patient to have lots and lots and lots of crises. So here's your two questions. What is the percent of patients with sickle cell disease that experience pain on most days? So that means most of their life they're experiencing pain. So what's that percentage? And then what percentage utilize the ED for pain control? All right, so you're already thinking of all of them. All of them come to the ED. I see them all the time. But in re reality, most of them have pain. Some of them have pain a lot. A third of them have pain almost every day. But we don't see them that often. So in our study, we have, um, in our population, we have a sickle cell center. We have about um, 1,000 patients in our sickle cell center. A lot of them are spread around Georgia uh, because we have outreach clinics. So Emory has their set and MCG has their set. So we have experience with a lot of sickle cell patients around Georgia. How many of y'all, let's say, if I ask you a question, how many case patients with sickle cell disease, not straight, we're talking about real sickle cell disease, if I get, I'll give you the percentage and you tell me which one you think is right, they have never come to the emergency department in our in our thousand patients. What percentage? Ten percent? Thirty percent? Fifty percent? Hundred percent? Okay. So, how many people think that out of the population of a thousand? 100% have come to the emergency department at least once in 10 years. Well, I got a couple. About 70%. All right. How about 50%? All right. So the rest of y'all are saying that at least half of the population doesn't come to the emergency department at all in 10 years. How about 30%? That means the vast majority don't ever come to the emergency department. All right. So in our population, about a third have never come to the emergency department ever. They just don't come to the emergency department. They can handle their pain at home. They can go to the clinic and get pain medicines, but they don't come to the emergency department. About a third come maybe once every couple years, and a third come frequently, so more than four times a year. And there's a small percentage, that's the, per that's the part that we overrepresent in our minds, that come very frequently. So you know who they are, and that's about 10%. So about 10%, you know their name, you see them all the time, and you're like, hey, you're back again. Do you have pain? Yes, of course you do. But when you look at the data, only about um, crisis is only um, happen about three and a half percent for that population. So they don't come very often. We just get a, um, a disproportionate sample in the emergency department. So when you look at a patient with sickle cell disease and they're coming in for pain, you have to do a good screening exam. And the reason is, is that pain, that's what we focus in on. We've been taught to focus in on pain. But pain is associated with that basal occlusion. And that could mean that there's an underlying serious code, code um, illness going along with it. So you really need to do your diagnosis and you really need to base it on their history and their vital signs. That's what we said was a key point. So lab tests really don't help you. They don't tell you whether somebody's having pain. They don't, and oftentimes they're really kind of misleading. So you look at somebody and their retic count is one. Right? There's clearly they're not having basal occlusive crisis. Their retic count is eight. Clearly they are. You can't tell from retic count. You just can't tell. And you can't tell from their hemoglobin either because they're all anemic. And you can't tell from a drop whether that's from an acute episode or if that's just their chronic disease. So many of, their, of these crises have a precipitating factor. Maybe stress, heat, rain. You know, full moon. You know, it's kind of hard to tell sometimes, but all of a sudden you've gone three or four days and you hadn't seen anybody with sickle cell disease, and all of a sudden you have four. Right? And what do you do? You're like, oh, uh, something must be different. And it's probably just something in the weather. That's all I can say. It just comes and goes, but you have to believe the patient. When the patient comes in and says that they're having the worst pain in their life, even though they look <coughs> calm like me, I, look, I hope I look relatively calm from all you guys, but even though they look calm, they may not be experiencing the pain the same way as you are. So if you were born and you didn't have an arm, you would not know what life is like without an arm. 
you would go on with your life and you would have an arm. If we look at that person, they would look very functional, but you go, well, you don't have an arm, but you, don't, you seem to be coping well. If you're born with sickle cell disease, then you have pain from day one. So your experience of pain may be very different than other people's experience of pain. The problem with providers in the ED is oftentimes because we don't believe them, they develop other mechanisms to cope with us as healthcare providers, which means that they have to act in a different manner to get our attention because they may be experiencing bad pain, but they don't look like it and they know you don't believe them. So they may start acting in a different way. So they may be more boisterous, loud, demanding, give me this, I'll be better. And so it's, it's very easy for us to look at somebody and then they're acting that way and we already think that they got sickle cell disease and I can't prove you're having pain. It's very easy for us to transfer on to them our feelings about what their disease is. So even though I'm telling you to believe about pain, treat their pain, you've really got to really focus in and get past that barrier that we have against patients that have this disease because sickle cell disease, when they come in with pain, is often associated with something else. And that something else is often life threatening to them. So you have to look for fever, hypoxia, hypotension. You have to look for those things because any of those means that they're having a life threatening condition. And we'll go through those in just a second. The other thing is, is you have to make sure that they're hydrated. Either too much or too little is bad for these um, patients because too much, they can get into congestive heart failure and that can kill them. If they're dehydrated, then they can have complications that come from more and more polymerization of those red cells, and you can get more and more occlusion. And then routine laboratory tests can help you decide. So again, this is the key point of the whole first part of this is history and, history and vital signs are number one and then physical exam. And then that should help you know what to do next. Ooh, well, that was interesting. Oh, okay. So. Everybody knows what rope dope is with Muhammad Ali, right? So, you know, you get these sickle cell patients, and they come in day after day after day. You've seen them, you've seen them, you've seen them, you've seen them. So that sickle cell disease, you know, they're up against the rope. We're getting beat. They're coming in, they're coming in. You just got pain. Here's your, some Percocet. Here's some morphine. Here's some dilaudid. Go home. Here's some Percocet. Here's some morphine. Here's some dilaudid. Go home. Here's some Percocet. Here's some morphine. Here's some dilaudid. Go home. And then the next time you see it, they're about to die. And so you don't want to miss that prodrome that maybe because they're coming in more frequently, they're having complications, all right? So when you start seeing them and they're coming in more, start really looking because you don't want to be knocked on the floor by sickle cell disease, right? Because you missed that they were really having a splenic sequestration crisis where they, were, they became acutely anemic or because they had a blood transfusion reaction and you just happened to miss it. So don't be a rope dope don't get, don't get suckered into that over and over kind of mentality and just doing a quick brief screen because these are the conditions that they die of. All right, acute chest, multi-organ failure, delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction. I know if you guys have been working in the emergency department for any length of time, you've seen a sickle cell patient come in and they just die and there's nothing you can do about it. You can try and you can say, oh, I'm gonna do ACLS, I'm gonna do it, they just die. And so you want to catch it before they get to that part. So let's talk a couple, about a couple of these life-threatening conditions. The answer going forward is always exchange transfusion, okay? So exchange transfusion, that's the answer. All right, so acute chest syndrome, what is that? Acute chest syndrome is any acute illness defined by fever or respiratory symptoms and a new infiltrate on chest x -ray. So as ED providers, we're used to seeing horses, right? There's a horse, there's a horse, there's a horse, right? There's a hoof beast, that must be a horse. So it's not pneumonia when it's acute chest. I mean, when it's a sickle cell patient, it's acute chest, all right? So even though it looks like pneumonia, you think it's pneumonia, treat them for acute chest. The reason is because we're gonna treat acute chest like pneumonia anyway, but you might send home a pneumonia, but you're not gonna send home acute chest because they will die of that quickly. So here's a couple examples, right? They don't have to be as obvious as the one over here. They don't have to be as obvious. It can be something small. And that any new infiltrate should mean that you need to treat it as acute chest, which means that you need to admit them and you should start treating them for the underlying cause. Now, if you look at this study, there's, a, you know, half the time you don't know what the precipitating factor was for the acute chest. 
You can see that fat embolism is probably number one, so that means those bony infarcts get embolized to the chest and that's, you know, to the lungs, and that's like a PE, but it's not a PE. It's a fat embolism, but it's not a PE. Um, and you can see that bacteria are often associated with acute chest. So we always treat them with broad spectrum antibiotics, no matter what. We always give them O2, supplemental O2, even if their SAT's 98%. You still put them on O2 because you want to stop that polymerization. Remember, hypoxia causes polymerization, which leads to this of the red cell. So when we give them oxygen, even though their SAT's okay, if their SATs are low anyway, then you definitely will get them oxygen. But you also want to pay attention to that fluid management. We talked about that before. So if you start overfilling them with fluid, it'll go into their lungs, it'll get into that area that's already damaged, and then their oxygenation will become much, much more difficult, and you'll cause more damage by just giving them fluid. And then pain management. So you wouldn't think about this, right? So pneumonia comes in, they got fluidic chest pain, you don't just say, hey, I'm gonna give you a bunch of morphine, right? But with sickle cell patients, you have to get their, their hormones down. You have to get that adrenal cortical axis to level off some. You need their arteries to open up. You need their blood pressure to go down. You need to do very good pain management. And if that's not working, if they're clinically deteriorating, as I told you before, the answer is always exchange transfusion, okay? Now, if you're working in a rural emergency department, you can't do an exchange transfusion, all right? That's something that you probably need to transfer the patient with. I'll suggest that if you're in a hospital that doesn't have a hematologist, you should transfer your patient when you think they have acute chest. All right, and it, in Augusta, we'll take them anytime. Emory will take them anytime. We'll, we'll take the patients, and we'd rather have them early than late. So I get, trans, I get patients, I can think of very vivid people that I've gotten in the, um, you know, they've been in a rural hospital for 12 hours while they're trying to treat their pain, and they knew that they were gonna admit them anyway. And by the time I get them, I'm way behind the eight ball because their hemoglobin's dropping at that point, and I need to transfuse them. So what is the downside of transfusion patients with sickle cell disease? Does anybody know? So they have two major ones. Right, so they've had blood transfusions for most of their life, so now we're seeing them as adults. So what happens when you get a lot of blood transfusions? The iron builds up, so they get hemochromatosis. So their heart gets stiff, they they're, can't give them a lot of fluid, you put them into renal failure. That's hard. But what's worse is they've had a lot of blood transfusions and now they have a lot of antibodies. So I've gotten patients from rural hospitals that are anemic, that are, their hemoglobin's two, and they're transferring, they're like, hemoglobin's two, I'm like, send them. By the time they get there, I have to go out to, I mean, we're in Augusta, so we go to Atlanta, we go to Columbia when we can't find blood, and by the time I get blood, the patient's dead. Because there's, there's not any blood that they're not going to have a reaction to in Augusta, or in even South Georgia, or East Georgia, or anywhere. <coughs> So just remember that if you think you're gonna transfuse them, that's, that's actually a pretty big emergency because you don't know what antibodies they have and how long it's gonna to take to get blood. So what's the difference between a red cell transfusion, just a simple transfusion versus exchange transfusion? So exchange transfusion, you're taking out the simple red blood cells and putting them back in the red cell. So it is a transfusion, but it should be volume equal. So you're not putting them over into that heart failure. Hopefully you're giving them a little less antigen so that they don't build up so much autoimmunity uh, to blood transfusions in the future, but most places can't do that. So it's very hard to do a paresis and take that blood out in you know, rural hospital, you're not gonna have that as an option. So when somebody comes in and they have sickle cell disease, they always have anemia, right? Because it's sickle cell anemia. They always have anemia. If they're SS, their hemoglobin is going to be less than 10, that's normal. So when you see them, you've got to ask them, what's your usual hemoglobin? They may not know that, but you need to look back in the chart and see what their usual hemoglobin is. If they're always six, that's their hemoglobin. You don't want them to be at 15 or 13 or 10. That's their hemoglobin, all right? So you have to say, okay, your hemoglobin's four. That's bad. I don't want to live with hemoglobin four, but are they symptomatic? So are they short of breath? Are they having problems? Because if they're not, you probably shouldn't transfuse them right then, all right? But if their hemoglobin, you see them today, their hemoglobin is six. They come back in for crisis again the next day and now it's five. You still send them home, they come back and it's four. That's bad, okay? It probably gets pretty yellow at that point from all the hemolysis. But those are things you need to be looking at. And then you need to think about, you know, what else am I missing? So their hemoglobin's dropping. Why is it dropping, right? Is it getting stuck in their liver or their spleen sequestration? Are they having an acute chest syndrome and I missed it? Is it multi-organ failure with bone marrow um, suppression? You know, you've got to be thinking about those things. And if you gave them a transfusion, please don't forget about a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction because 
that they have antibodies and you give them blood, their hemoglobin drops instead of coming up. So I really want you, this is the other take on point, to really consider getting a hematology consultation if you really think you need to trans transfuse a patient. I wouldn't transfuse, I don't transfuse people in the ED or the observation unit where I treat sickle cell patients without a hematologist. The reason is, is sometimes you don't need to transfuse them. And remember, they can only have so many transfusions in their life. And there, a lot of them are getting chronic transfusions to keep them from having strokes and complications of sickle cell disease. So if you start giving them other blood and you haven't screened it properly, it might really cause them longer term health care, uh, health issues than if you just left them alone. Fever. Fever should need to be taken very, very seriously. So whenever you see fever in a sickle cell disease patient, and this is not the surgery definition of fever, this is fever, 38 degrees, you need to do medical. All right, that sounds overly cautious, but the reason is, is that they're immunosuppressed. They don't have spleen. They don't react to bacteria as well as we do. And when they get sick, they get sick quickly. So if you see somebody with a fever, think about admitting them, because they can have any of these things, pneumococcal sepsis and gram-negative sepsis. So it's usually not that hard to figure out. Urinary tract infections are not that hard to figure out. Osteomyelitis, though, that might be hard to figure out, because they've got pain everywhere, and you just kind of miss it because you just didn't have time to figure out that it was really a bone infection and, or that ulcer that we just kind of looked at and moved on about. Abdominal pain. This is super common with people with sickle cell disease. Super common. So we see it all the time. Most of the time, the vast majority of the time is vasoclusion. So if somebody comes in and they say, I always have abdominal pain with my sickle cell disease, I'm not getting a CT scan. I'm just, okay. Good, all right, this is your usual pain, good. History and vital signs are the key to evaluate the sickle cell patient. If they say it's new, then I'm gonna be very concerned. So there is some differences between that SS that we usually think about with sickle cell disease and SC. Remember, SC is a milder form of, hem of sickle cell anemia than SS. SS is the more severe. So you see somebody that happens to be, you know, 18, 19 years old, they're coming into the adult emergency department, you know, the pediatric, pediatric emergency doctors, they have a little bit better sense of some of the complications you see early in life with patients with sickle cell disease. But, you know, you're thinking, hey, you know, I don't need to worry about this left upper quadrant pain because they don't have a spleen. You know, they're an adult. Their spleen is gone. It's auto-infarcted. But in SC, I've seen patients with SC that have had a spleen at 20, 22, and it's this big, and all their blood's sitting in their spleen. So you gotta remember that sometimes things don't present exactly the same way because they have all this phenotypic variation. So if you think that they're having abdominal pain, you think that you need to do a study, please do a study. But if they're usual chronic pain, it's probably okay just to let it lie and see if their pain gets better with whatever you're doing for their vaso-occlusive crisis. What about acute neurologic symptoms? So a quarter of patients with sickle cell disease have a neurologic manifestation. There's probably a much higher instance of silent infarcts. <coughs> And some of those behaviors that we see are silent infarcts. You know, they start losing, getting frontal um, strokes and they start acting differently as they get older. But at least 25% have some kind of either ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke during their lifetime. All right? That it is much more common for a sickle cell patient to have either one of those. You may, all, you may just think that it's ischemic, but hemorrhagic also is too because of that vasculopathy we talked about. And what's the problem with just doing your normal workup for stroke? So here's some CTs and MRI. Does anybody know what the problem with a sickle cell disease about just doing your normal stroke workup? All right, you call them a code stroke. They can't move their arm or they're acting confused. CTs lie, right? CT picks up the hemoglobin that's in blood, but they're anemic. So when your hemoglobin is down past 10, your CT scan becomes less and less sensitive. All right? Your non-contrast CT becomes less sensitive. So when you're down at 6, 5, the blood is isoechoic and you can't see it, all right, on a CT scan. And so if you really think that somebody's having a, uh, a stroke, I just go past CT, I mean, a non-con CT. I just get a, a CT angio or I get an MRI, MRI. Because that's the only way you're really going to know. And I can tell you that I've had one, you know, one of the ones is uh, up there, and the neurosurgeon didn't believe me. I'm like, this is a stroke. This is a hemorrhagic stroke. I said, yeah, there's a little bit of blood in there. And he goes, I don't see it. I don't believe you. I did an LP. Nothing but blood came out. I go, ah, oh, you hit a vein. All right. So I get a CT uh, MRA. Yeah, there's, there's that big aneurysm. See, now you believe me? Yes. 
But the treatment is also different too. So you think ischemic stroke, TPA. Ischemic stroke, TPA. But in sickle cell disease, that may not be the may not be the thing to do. Okay, there's not a lot of good studies on thrombolytic in sickle cell disease patients. Um, but the answer is always exchange transfusion. So that's always the answer. So whether it's ischemic or hemorrhagic exchange transfusion or, or what you need to do, if it's a hemorrhagic stroke and they've got an aneurysm from that, then coiling usually, which means that you probably need to transfer the patient to. And then if they have a cerebral vein thrombosis, then it's anticoagulant. All right, this is the last complication I'm going to talk about. So, priapism. So, um, by age 20, 89% of males will have at least one episode. All right? That means that they all get it. All right? And it's, um, it's pretty easy to discount that because it doesn't seem like it's a life-threatening complication of sickle cell disease, but it's, true, it's a true emergency. All right, so um, I don't, we're not covering it today in the procedure course, but you know, you can learn how to do aspiration and irrigation. It's not hard to do. We do it in the emergency department at SDG fairly regularly. The residents do it, um, and it works very well. We don't always have urology there to help us, um, but if you don't feel comfortable with that, I would transfer a patient immediately because you want to do that in, within the first four hours of um, onset. So. That can take you a little while to get somebody out of a rural environment, but we'll always take them at MCG. So that's, that's all I have. Um, I'll take any questions. And I want to throw a plug out for next year. So next year, we're, um, this conference moves around the state, and so next year we're going to be in Augusta. Uh, Dr. Williams and I have a running competition, so there's about 150 people registered for this conference this year. We're going to shoot for 200, and it's going to be a really special conference, so you should register now because there's going to be limited space. There's going to be an ultrasound lab. We're going to have one here today, but there's going to be um, a very big ultrasound lab. There's also going to be a live tissue lab, so you'll get to do um, procedures in a little bit more of a true environment instead of a simulated environment like we're going to do today. There's going to be a cadaver lab. And then there's going to be a um, state-of-the-art simulation lab where you'll get to um, run codes or run through scenarios. It's going to be really um, exciting, but you know, if 200 people show up, 200 people can't fit in the animal lab. So um, I would suggest you register early so that we can make preparations so we can get as many people in as we can. And there's a discount right now. In a couple weeks, it's going to go up for these. So I'd register early and now and make plans for next year this time. Thank you, guys. Thank <laughs> you.